<laughs> so uh, I'm Rob Sherwood, uh, CTO at Big Switch Networks, and I'm going to talk in a bunch of different parts about our Big Cloud Fabric product. Uh, the first part I'm going to talk about is giving you guys kind of a, a visceral feel of what it's like to set up and kind of day-to-day -day manage this box. Um, all the kind of lower level implementation questions are, are actually going to be in the, in the next section. So you know, feel free to, to ask those questions, but I may punch you off to the, the next section. So uh, in, in the last talk, Kyle was talking about a pod. So what, what does a pod look like in, in practical terms? right? So in practical terms, what we mean is there is a collection of racks, say up to 16 racks, um, with servers in them. Uh, at the top of each rack is uh, two leafs. Um, and then you, each server is dual connected to one of each of the leaves for redundancy. And then those leaves connect up to spine switches, uh, up to 16 in our, our large, uh, up to six in our large design. Um, the leaf switches are 48 by 10 gigs with six 40 gigs going up. The spine switches are 32 by 40. This is all standard Broadcom uh, bare, uh, bare metal switch hardware. And with this, you can actually connect to uh, an upstream router, to additional services, and what we provide is just an extremely high level of east-west bandwidth traffic. Uh, we provide a single chunk of configuration. Um, and, and I'll talk in some detail in this talk about how we provide this kind of unified L2, L3 fabric, where there's not preconceived notions of where the L2, L3 boundaries are. Um, <coughs> just so it said, uh, this is supposed to be very interactive. So I'm going to start saying crazier and crazier stuff if you guys don't start asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> Scale Absolutely. Um, there's this uh, concept that uh, you, you even see on the HBO show Silicon Valley of uh, minimum viable product. Um, what, what we're looking at right now is 16 is the, the minimum viable product. And that actually ends up being a bit of a, a balance between how big do you want it versus how big do you want a failure domain to be. And so that's kind of a sweet spot both for where the hardware is uh, as well as you know, how, if you lose an entire pod, and that's possible, you know, how big of a blast do you want that to be? More questions? No, I was just thinking about that because you know, like 16 racks at typical current densities, that's a lot of it's a lot of systems. Yeah. And yeah, I'd probably be more concerned about the failure domain rather than wanting to put more and more and more systems in there. I'd be more thinking actually I want to chunk it up a bit here. Well, and so that's yeah. why, you know, at least for, for our purposes, 16 is big enough, so that's not really a concern for people. Mm. Um, so do you want a failure domain bigger than 16 racks? Most customers, when you dig down into it, they come up with, oh, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Um, eight racks is about what we're seeing. You know, it depends really what, what does failure mean. and ends up being a very personal thing, right? So if this is it's a... It's failure means that thing that I had that broke on me all those years ago, and I still feel burnt by it. Yeah. <laughs> Versus you know, if you imagine this is a big data run over this week's sales numbers, and if the... Uh, if the result is an hour delayed and everybody doesn't really care, then you know, it actually makes a lot of sense to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, but to your question, absolutely, we have plans both to go multi-rack, uh, multi-pod, uh, as well as to have bigger pods. Um, but it, it, you do have this kind of interesting tension for failure domain in terms of size. As you grow bigger, are you going to do something about the um, failure domains, like kind of isolate them somehow, but they still kind of all... And, and so the, the idea with multi-pod is the, the idea is a, a single pod should be a failure domain, and then you'd have some kind of... Th this is getting way ahead of, of you know, what we've actually implemented. I, I'm trying to focus on what we've implemented, but just so you know, we, we do have plans to have kind of a management level on top of that. So you're like a... Con con not necessarily a controller of controllers, but a... I don't know. That, that may or may not be the internal design yeah, name. Yeah, it yeah. also depends on what, what exactly. <laughs> it depends on what you're trying to push between the the pods, right? Like, yeah. are you federating like routing information, or you're federating abstract policies? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It really depends. And, and on also, what, you, you want to be a little bit careful there because you don't want to cause the coupling to be too tight to spread the failure domain. So you actually want. Right. Uh, we, we think of it almost as uh, a lot of the early days of OpenFlow, where people were talking about hierarchical control, or uh, we were talking about centralized control, and we, we like to push hierarchical control. So um, almost all the control functions are actually on our controller. But as I'll talk about later, we've actually pushed some of those down into the individual switch plane. Um, and then you know, as we get to kind of this larger scale model, we'll actually have another layer of that hierarchy there. And so 
the, the exact design choices and how loose this coupling is it, is really where a lot of the magic is, and then the design of these things. So, so when I hear controller of controller or something, you know, something like that, what I really hear is, uh, you know, core distribution and access. You know, back to that kind of three layer so design. That is a data plane concept. Sure. Where what I'm talking about is really a management concept. Okay, I, I see that, and I guess I guess what I'm really asking there is. What um, when 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 we're looking at okay if we're going multiple pods and we're we're actually, let's know, go to this picture because okay. I think it gets exactly oh, you know, what you're getting. Go, to. go ahead. You, no, no, I think no, you're no. going to answer my question as you go. So so yeah. go ahead and, and if, if if you don't answer, I'll swing back around to it. Well, so, just to clarify one point though, the yeah. 16 racks. Those are 16 racks, 32 top of racks. Yes. Could you do 32 individual yes. if you wanted to? So actually, l let me pop back to here. So actually, the, the the limit there is actually not at all our software. It's actually the Broadcom hardware. So. Um, each of these leafs has six 40 gig uplinks. So that means you can have a maximum of six spines. So in a leaf spine fabric, every leaf must connect to every spine. And then so that gets you a maximum of 32 leafs can connect to a spine, and the spines only have 32 links. And so that, that, that actually falls directly out from, from the hardware okay, there. Cool. It, it's not our limit, and we've actually got some interesting designs to even go past this with the, the existing hardware. Um, so the, the point I was going to make here about you know, how this slots in is if you imagine, and this is the pictorial view of uh, Kyle's uh, uh, core, core pod design, you've got a base core of routers that maybe connect to the internet. You know, those are the thing, that's the infrastructure that goes in when you design the data center and probably that goes, the only time that goes down is when you decommission the data center. That, that is your, your trusted core. And the idea is maybe you have different generations of pods that go in and big cloud fabric would slip in as the next generation of pod. And so uh, kind of the point of this picture is to, to give you a big picture view of how this works, but also really to, to underscore we're not asking people to throw away their, their equipment. That was always kind of the big boogeyman with, with SDN. You, know, you don't throw away the core, you don't throw away your old designs. We slot in with the rest of the, the, the next generation of gear that goes in. Uh, questions uh, about this? So do you, do you dedicate a certain rack then for perimeter integration, you know, board reliefs, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them? As pictured there, yes. Um, and so, it just in practical terms, that you don't even need to dedicate a rack from our standpoint. It just makes admins' lives easier. So if you, if you happen to have two racks worth of you know that that's good too. But but in theory, though, could you put let's say you know an external device in each rack? Yes. Okay. Uh, and so how this looks in practice, and for folks who were on the machine room tour, uh, hopefully you, you saw something that looked a little bit like this. Uh, and for folks who weren't, we will maybe catch a, a session afterwards. Um, this would be a, a standard rack with as many servers as you can fit into it, up to, to 48. Two leaf switches at the top. Um, have a, a management switch for the backplane traffic, or for the, for the management traffic. Two leaf switches here, and then you would have two physical controller nodes that would hook to the management network. If you had OpenStack, this is where you'd probably put your OpenStack controller. Uh, to Jason's question, you would have probably, um, you know, if you had some firewalls, you might drop those in here. Um, you can have external that is to the core connectivity from any of the leaves. Um, you know, kind of the, the recommended design from us is to have it from a single point, but that's, it's really just for management sanity. There, there's no data plane limitations there. <laughs> Other questions along these lines? Um, so one of the things that people get scared of when they hear uh, you know, the, the, this Android model where you might get the hardware differently from the software is, well, how do I do the hardware-software integration? Please, dear God, don't make me use Z modem to install more software on more, more switches, right? You know, that, that's just horrible. So one of the things that we have is something that we call zero-touch fabric, which is as the switches turn on, so they would ship from a company, um, you know, something like Acton, something like Dell, uh, with a very small piece of software on it, it's an open source piece of software that I'm involved in with uh, Open Compute called ONI, the Open Network Install Environment. And as you turn on the box, it actually will net boot from the controller. So the controller is also an ONI server and actually downloads dynamically both the, the actual image that runs on that box, uh, Switchlight is the, the operating system that we built in house, uh, as well as all the config, the dynamic information that it needs. Does that do um, like ongoing software management of those yes. as well? Yes, and so I'll actually have a, a couple slides talking about doing a, a live upgrade. Cool. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, I'm like rolling out, progressively rolling it out and whatever and with minimal disruption, that kind yeah. of thing. And, and so uh, it'll come back exactly to uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention is the way we recommend hooking this up means that there's multiple paths to everywhere. 
Um, and these are actually active, active connections everywhere. And so if you lose, you can actually lose one link out of every server and actually still keep going. You lose capacity, not connectivity. And, and that'll come back up when, when we hit upgrade. So the workflow here is you, you, know, you cable it up, your dual top of racks, three switch spine, in addition then an out of band management switch, controllers there, yep. switches there, and the auto discovers as you get yep. up. Exactly. You know, it's, uh, the, the protocol looks like a, a lot like Pixie Boot, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. I, I haven't talked to you about you know, how it works. but For what you're seeing, just curious in terms of betas and tests, those out of band switches, are you seeing you know, a white box trend there as well, or just you know, an off the shelf you know, name brand, but really cheap switch? Um, I've seen it go both ways. Uh, and actually, you know, talking about minimum viable product, uh, next couple versions of this, we're going to pull that into an in band control. Okay. Um, just honestly, right now, uh, it hasn't really mattered to people that most people will have something kind of lying around. Uh, we, we end up using a you know a fairly low end uh, switch uh, that's not a white box switch uh, down at the data center that I think I showed a couple of you guys. Okay. Um, another thing that we do is we actually auto discover all the links in the topology, and we have um, management software that will tell you if you're missing a link or if you've got something doubly connected or something like that. And I'll, I'll show that in the demo. Um, and we also have software uh, that, that does uh, LACP or LADP to infer the connectivity up to the switches as well, uh, for, to, from the, the servers to the switches. So you can think of this as most of the wiring problems. In a traditional network, there is some box somewhere that knows there's a problem. The question is, do you as the admin know to go query that box? You know, if, if server 15 is missing a, a, an uplink to, to switch number 5, you could go iterate through your entire network in a regular manner and try to figure that out, or you can have a centralized controller that continually pulls that information and reports it back to you. you know, uh, maybe stepping back a little bit, all of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about here, in theory, if you could type infinitely fast and never make mistakes, you could actually do a fair chunk of this on your own. But I don't know about you guys, but I don't type that fast, and I do make mistakes. Uh, and so uh, it's really, you, you really just want a computer to help you out with this. What about things like you know link state tracking is a feature other vendors have. So uplinks are down. And do you shut down the server links to that top rack switch to automatically redirect? We, we can do exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, more questions. Does it send an alert to someone or just the controller can? So um, we have a couple different mechanisms where it gets exposed. So we do support standard SNMP. So uh, if you want to like set up a trap uh, through your existing systems, we can do that. Um, we do also expose the information through the, the CLI, which makes it show up in both the, uh, I'm sorry, through the REST API, which makes it show up in both the CLI and the, uh, and the GUI. And, and actually, for those of you who, who tried BSN Labs, um, that is actually the, uh, the first beta of our software. Um, I'm going to show you on the, the, the updated beta uh, that actually has that fairly nicely integrated. So are you, are you exposing counters and things like that via the CLI? Yeah. And would you expect still to extract data from the device itself for lower level counters or just more visibility for, for something? Absolutely. And what, so, is that, and what is that something? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do in this space. We're really only scratching the surface. Uh, what gets really interesting, just to throw something completely random and exotic at you guys, um, we're in talks through open compute with a couple of different optics manufacturers. Who, you know, internally, they have all sorts of power level information and, and they right, have right. stats at the optics level where, I mean, mm. you know, even if that was exposed up through your, your traditional operating system, you're not going to pull that over time and you know, trying to understand what power level is the right level, who knows. But you know, with their, their expertise of understanding what's the right power level and what changes over time and the centralized controller to aggregate that information, the, the, the belief is, and we have to proof this out, but just to give you something to think about, we could actually infer when cables are starting to go bad before they do. Or if you've got a crimp, you know, if this cable is maybe crimped a little bit too far, or, or something like that, and those are the really thorny problems. Like, you know, I'm losing one packet out of a hundred, and I don't know why. Mm. Right. Um, so actually, let me jump to uh, the the first uh, of many demos here. Uh, I'm going to show our graphic user environment. I'm going to show what it looks like to, to actually provision this uh, the first time and. Um, See, take a look at some of the errors that we get out of the switch when we do it wrong. So what we're looking at here 
Um, this entire demo is actually emulated off of my laptop. Uh, I've got a, an entire virtual network there. Um, we have a graphical representation that we have two controllers. Uh, they're actually marked green, so we know they're active. We've got a list of spine switches. Right now, there's only one configured. Uh, we've got a bunch of leaf switches in pairs, except for this last one. It's missing its pair. Um, and we have two switches, which are connected to our controller, but we don't have a role for them. So they're kind of in a disabled mode of pre-configured. Um, and notably, and I think this is to, to Amy's question, there's a little mark in the top right here that says I've got two errors and four warnings. And if I click on this, you know, there's a, a fairly clear thing that says there's something wrong with the controller. Uh, and for folks who can't read, it says, you know, there are two switches, they're suspended. Here's what's going on. Tell me what to do with them. Uh, and by the way, you're missing some critical links. And so if I go back to this fabric view and I look at the MAC addresses, and most people don't have MAC addresses memorized, but this is a demo, um, I'm going to say, I know this one by MAC address is the, the spine switch. So I'm going to drop this in here and say, your spine zero, that's the, the human readable name that I think makes sense. And this switch is leaf 3B, and it's part of rack 3. And so now we've actually got all of this together. We jump over to our fabric summary, and now we see our fabric is good. So. This was, I mean, if, when you go to cable these things up, you've got cables going everywhere. Let me show you, you know, this is a little toy example. This is a list of all the links. You know, for the toy example, we have over 100 links. You're going to make a mistake when you do this. Having an automated thing that walks through all of the links that runs an algorithm that says, you actually missed this spot and this spot, I mean, that saves you hours of your life. Uh, questions about this so far? Um, th there's all sorts of nice little indicators. If you click on this stuff, it'll tell you what the link status is. Um, if any of you are close enough to see, um, there are these little dots here that actually indicate link status. And so some of these have a red dot. You know, that's a link that's not hooked up. Uh, you get this nice little quick visual representation of, of what's going on. Uh, questions about this? So ki kind of related to this, some people watching this might say, but I don't want my network to look like a leaf spine. It's a special snowflake that needs to look this other way. What, how do you address I, that? And I tell those people that you know, to, to go forth and prosper, that there are many existing network tools to, to help solve that problem. Um, the product that we have built right now today that we're shipping at the end of the month um, is focused exactly on leaf spine. Now, can we take this technology and adapt it very slightly to work for more general topologies? Absolutely. Um, that said, you know, uh, success as a startup is being really laserly, narrowly focused. And so this product is focused on leaf spine in a pod for data center. And we've had customers, and boy, do they drive me crazy. They want to take this same design and deploy it over a wide area network with MPLS pseudo wire connecting things and, you know, crazy technologies. And it, it absolutely would make sense and provide benefit for them. But, you know, we, you know the success in, in, the, in business is pick one thing and do it well. Um, and we've picked two. We'll get to Big Tap in a second. But uh, at least for, for this case, you know, this is the only thing we're, we're, we're targeting. More questions? You want to see more slides? This demo stuff is crap. <laughs> <laughs> what is your take on, on mid market in a smaller enterprise? Because the, you know, Google, large scale, bringing it down to the enterprise you know, makes sense. And that's where a lot of the market traction has been over the past, you know, four years, you know, in this space. But when you look at it sort of, you know, all in one solution, you know, 16 racks is still fairly large for an average customer. You know, is there any thought on trying to, you know, target that sort of market? So I, I like to chop the market up kind of grossly into three chunks. There's kind of like the, the hyperscale people, the Facebooks and Googles of the world. Um, we try to look at what we're doing, what they're doing, try to learn from them, and you know, honestly, I try to feedback what we're doing to them, but we're never gonna sell stuff to them. They have 500, like, one of these companies I, I know in some detail has like five or 600 engineers working on this. You know, we've had about 50 plus engineers working for four years. And so, that it's clear that they're kind of ahead of this. Then kind of the, the next is large-ish enterprise, so you know, say Fortune 1000, something like that. They're the people who I think are maybe m the biggest target of this. 
And that, that can actually go into probably medium enterprise. And at the small enterprise where anything larger than a single rack it, it looks, starts to look a little bit big for you, you actually frankly don't need this level of automation. You can keep all the bits together in your head and do the mental calculus to jump through, well, how many ports do I need to enable this VLAN? Two. But it's still, it's, it's that same customer that bought Meraki over the past couple of years, and they built a great niche like in that market. And in terms of like turnkey solutions for data center, like this is that for potentially the same market. You know what I mean? So um, one of the reasons why I'm CTO of this company is that the, the technology is so cool, there's all sorts of things we can do with it. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely want to do all of those things. Uh, at the same time, you know, we need to be very practical about the first thing that we're going to do is X, and the second thing we do is Y. That said, I think you know, the notion of centralization, the notion of having this disaggregated software, uh, the notion of having different topologies that actually, you know, at a topology level, you can grow with the design, uh, that can be applied to the entire network. Access, campus, you know, uh, we, we'll talk about LTE like, later. You know, that th absolutely these themes can be replayed. But in terms of the products we're shipping today, very na narrowly, laserly focused. Control network is in-band? Uh, this is out of band. So uh, the, the exact wiring is the switches actually have a physically out of band management port. And that would go to a dedicated switch, which would then hook to the controller. So there's a dedicated control network that you need to build <laughs> yeah. between controller and each component yeah. here. Um, so what's your take on links that fail internally and how that would affect everything? What's I have your... an entire slide all about that because it's, it's a really important topic. Uh, if I could put that off for, a, it's actually yeah. towards the end of my talk. Yep. But. Very good. Uh, other questions? Oh, this is not a slide. <laughs> oh. You're kidding me. All right, so that was the demo that I just showed. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's how you set up a fabric. Um, next thing is how do you manage it? So if you imagine, you know, once you've got this up, you actually have this kind of amorphous cloud of all your physical machines, all your virtual machines, all within a pod. So what, what do you want to do with this? And so what we found most people would, that we want to do is chop up into L2 segments, chop up to L3 segments, apply some policy. This section can talk to this section, this section can't. So, you know, how do you chop this up? And so the, the management primitives that we have uh, we have something that we call a logical segment. It looks a lot like a VLAN. Uh, and you can say arbitrarily through the fabric, this port with this VLAN tag, potentially untagged off of this switch, goes into this L2 segment. And you can kind of pick and choose them arbitrarily. And so once you have an L2 segment, you can create a couple of them. And then you can put them, you can L3 connect them with a concept that we call a logical router. So a logical router is a, a management thing that works a lot like your intuition of what a router is. It's not a physical thing. There's not a bottleneck. There's not hair point or hairpin routing. Uh, I'll talk about how the, we implement the logical router in the, the next part of this talk. But the cool thing here is this is actually an isolated stack. So somebody else's L2 domain and somebody else's logical router are completely isolated. Policy that you apply to one is not, does not affect the other at all. You know, uh, hinting a, a little bit of how this is implemented, each logical router corresponds to a VRF. And so you, know, you, you get, kind of get VRFs for in, in a very easy, intuitive notion here. Is this open flow slicing underneath? Uh, no, so it's actually, you know, we're leveraging the VRF hardware direct from the chip. So when, when I said, um, if you could type infinitely fast and never make mistakes, you know, each one of these things, you could actually do this logically with VLAN translation and a VLAN and then map them all into their own unique VRFs. So this far, you could actually do today on existing networks if you could log into every switch and type really fast. So from a security perspective, it's exactly the same because it's actually using the same parts of the underlying switching hardware. Mm -hmm. cool. More questions on this? Because this is, this is kind of a critical thing that we end up building on. You, you said... Uh that you can choose VLAN tags or untagged interfaces arbitrarily so and add them into this bridge domain? Yeah. What's the use case for mixing and matching tags, typically? I, so, I've had to do it a couple of times, but I can't think of why it's a selling point. Um, if you take like a, um, like a VMware deployment, and what you have on each, uh, each, each ESX instance is a bunch of different tenants. So the question is, when you declare on the vSwitch the egress VLAN tag, 
is that a global VLAN tag or is it local to this vSwitch? Do I just want to say the first one I create is VLAN 1 and the second one's VLAN 2 and then I do the mapping from the local vSwitch VLAN tag to the global fabric one in the fabric or do I want to, that how much coordination does the network guy need with the server guy? I see. Uh, that's just one case. There, there's actually, I mean, I think everybody who's used VLAN tags or VLAN translation has ended up with weird kind of long tail pathological cases, but I think that's the one that's, that's most normal for people. Makes sense. Other questions? Just curious, was that a change over the past several years in terms of using the hardware for VRFs versus slicing? Um, in terms of how Big Switch has implemented yeah. its software? I mean, honestly, uh, from about two years ago, we, we actually went, and I do not want to start a religious war about overlays versus, or versus not, but we had an overlay product, and at least for us, for the feedback we were getting, it wasn't working for us. It wasn't going to work for the customers that we were talking about. And it wasn't that our product wasn't stable. It wasn't that our product wasn't featureful. I think we built a pretty decent overlay product. It just wasn't going to do what we wanted it to do. And so we ended up throwing away all of that. So that didn't use anything like what we're doing now. And it's completely different. And now we're actually using, you know, to, you're using the hardware the way the hardware was designed to be used. Right. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more of that in the next talk, in the next section. This product is better than the overlay solution. What were the complaints that you were hearing? So, um, uh, at risk of getting into that religious debate, it's a fair question, though. Um, in my mind, overlays are, are an L2 solution. You know, they, they don't—they don't actually solve your L3 problems for you. Uh, and a lot of the customers that we talked to had L3 problems, which is you know, on ingress into the overlay network. How do I map this to a tenant? Sure. Um, and it turns out that's an important problem. And if you don't solve that at hardware line rate you can have bottlenecks. You know, another problem is how do I integrate this with uh, an external service like a firewall? Uh, something I'll talk about in, in a bit. You know, that's another L3 point. It's not really, like, overlays are a great L2 solution. Mm. And so th those are the things that we ran into. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it is possible to, at a policy level, say two tenants can talk to each other. And the, the, the notion that we have there, we call it a system router. So you can imagine, you know, the, the mental model we hope customers have is, you know, in a multi-tenant world, what you'd really, really like to have is to be able to magically pop up, like wave your wand and make a, a router appear and give each tenant its own router. And then if you really wanted two tenants to talk to each other, and maybe that's a weird use case, you'd have like another tenant that you would actually physically hook the wires up between them. And so that's actually the, the management interface that we have here. So even though it's one shared fabric, it's one physical piece of, of, of hardware, um, that's still the, the management primitive we give to people. So you give each tenant its own router. Routes in that one tenant don't affect anyone else unless you say, I want you to connect up to the system router. Yeah, I'm trying to think about this since you're using the v, you know, VRF under, you know, that hardware underneath. To go between then, you're using that system router. So are both, are both? So the, are, the, the are, magic here is the system router is in its own VRF. And we do a lot of the, the monkey tricks underneath that if you want to have connectivity from tenant A to system router to tenant B, right. we effectively do what looks a lot like route propagation between them. Yeah, my question was, okay, gonna be more around, you know, the best time, you know, I, the best list I've ever heard this was, you know, from another company a couple of years ago, it was just, you know, where's the default gateway? And I was like, oh, everywhere but nowhere, you know, in terms of who's hosting, you know, that Mac and IP. So I guess, you know, for the logical router and system router, do they both exist sort of pseudo everywhere? Yes, uh, I have exactly a slide on that in the next talk. Let me come back to that if that's okay. So actually, let me just show you what the what this looks like in practice for how you use it. I'm gonna very, very quickly create a tenant, a couple routers, uh, a couple logical segments, uh, and assign some physical ports to them just so you guys can understand the, the workflow. So I go to our handy little tenant bar here, hit the plus. Um, is that any better? Uh, just create a tenant called green. I'm going to create two logical segments. Think of this like um, quite often what you know a, a use case that people use is uh, something like uh, multi uh, 
multi-tiered web applications. So say this is a two-tiered web application. I'm going to throw server one in this VLAN. I'm going to throw server two in this VLAN. Uh, these things can all be auto-populated through LACP. Uh, and in fact, we've got this nice trick with LLGPs that if you put an LLGP instance on the host, it'll actually even push out its host name. So that can all get uh, auto-populated into here. So that, now I've created one logical segment. I'll create another logical segment. Put another two servers into it. And this ends up being, not the switch interface, sorry. So uh, the port groups are, are, are a notion of lag. So these are just lagged up servers. If I wanted to, I could actually just insert uh, a, a single port, but you know, lags are better. And those lags are it's definitely multi-chassis. They could be anywhere in the they, fabric. Um, so we have a, a slight restriction that we have, uh, you can only have lags inside a rack. OK. But you can have them in any racks uh, across any connection of ports up to, I think it's 16 ports. So let me, since you asked, let me pop up our little um, display here. So if I wanted to edit a lag, um, I don't know if you can see this. So we've got two leafs, leaf 0A and leaf 0B. These are the two leafs in the same rack. Um, and the server, uh, server 1, is hooked up to ETH1 of the, ser of the first switch. and ETH Basically, it's ETH1 of both switches. Mm -hmm. um, and I happen to know that these ports are in use for other things. But if you wanted to just so. Maybe the, the, the clearest thing I can say is we actually don't differentiate between lag and mlag. Like they, they both, I mean. And that, that's why I brought it up just Yeah. To, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that I forget actually causes problems for people anymore because we've been doing the same thing for so long. I mean, the, the model, and I'll talk a little bit more of this later, is these, are, these switches are more like line cards. And you know, in a, uh, a multi line card switch, you wouldn't expect to have to differentiate between lags on the same line card versus lag, la, lags across line cards. And, and we don't either for, the, for those same reasons. And so the restriction to a rack is really because of the very specific topology that you're building, yeah. not any limitation of any sort. It's just. And there are some very nice failover tricks that we can, actu we can uh, make failover times much faster as a result of that assumption. Um, but you know, in general, you're right. There's nothing that would stop us from going multi, multi rack. Is there any integration to things like vCenter to see which VMs exist in which It's literally on the roadmap. Uh, we do have integration with uh, OpenStack right now uh, to do that same thing. Uh, it just honestly becomes a you know, what customers are asking for first. Uh, and while, you know, yes, vCenter has a, a much bigger deploy base than OpenStack right now, if you look at what are going, people are creating new racks. Um, it, it's actually interesting, you know, OpenStack I, I, is great, uh, it's useful for us, but it's also a great way of identifying a customer who's willing to try something crazy. Uh, so if you're willing to try OpenStack, you should be willing to try us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're a lot more stable than that. Uh, more questions on this? So I guess, you know, I, I, I didn't actually say the ta-da of the, the demo, but, you know, the, the ta-da is, I, I very quickly collect, collected a bunch of switches, threw them in some VLANs, and now they're routing between them. And now I've, I've, strung, I've, I've put together a tenant, like even before I went on my lag tangent. So what was that, 30 seconds? So a question then. If you had um, two pod build outs and you had two tenants, one in each pod that wanted to communicate, how would that look from a topology level? Do you just interconnect the spines, or do you connect it via the kind of communications? So pod? actually, and you know, uh, thanks for, for calling this out. Um, you, as the network admin, the guy pushing the buttons, don't have to worry about that. And so what I actually did here, and I didn't say this properly, the first two servers are in one rack, and the second two servers are in the other rack. And the controller actually figures out all the backend spine connectivity, all of the, really think of it like the VLAN trunking and all of the routes that, that have to happen. We end up creating like a slash 32 for each server, and we, we, we populate that route through the system. And so all of that stuff that you're kind of used to doing, you don't have to do anymore. And so if, if you wanted to, to span a VLAN between racks, it's as easy as clicking what I just did. So I mean, um, between completely separate pods. So if you have oh, okay. you know, one spinal leaf network and another one, yeah. um, you think, right, my tenant's grown. I need a little bit more capacity over here. How would I then get that connectivity? So for that type of thing, what we'd recommend is you can actually create a bunch of lags between them. 
um, and then uh, using the VLAN translation features, you know, mark if you want to span a tenant across them, you can you know have a VLAN 100 mean tenant number, you know, tenant green, like I said, on one side, and have it come in on the other side and span that way. Would you do that at the spine level, or would you do it via the via the services kind uh, of? You would do it uh, through any leaf. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, in case people ask, and, and you know, I have been asked this before, I hope this doesn't scare anyone, uh, yes, you can run ECMP over lags. Uh, and so, if you really do want like 256 ports of connectivity between two things, you can do that. <coughs> Anybody actually do that in practice? I'm curious. Like, yeah, so, some people definitely do do that, and it's actually an important use case for people. They go, what? Only you know, 16, you know, 160 gigs between something? That's not enough. You know, I, I need my two terabytes. 